And I don't know about you. I know in my personal spiritual life, I tend to go after God more when times are are bad than when times are good. And we saw that happen on 9-11. Uh, we saw people come together. It wasn't about whether you were a Democrat or a Republican. It was about us being Americans. And you saw some incredible things on the, on the Capitol steps. You saw people crying out to God. And, uh, you know, things got a little bit better, and you didn't see that so much. And uh, I'd love for us to go after God with that kind of fervency, not only when times are bad, but when times are good, right? But I think it's important that we remember that event and remember how we came together as a country because it just seems like there are so many things, especially today, that are fracturing our country. And uh, Christ can bring us all back together again. So what I'd like us to do I'd like us to stand for a moment of silence, and uh, we are going to watch a minute and a half video that kind of helps us gain a proper perspective of 9-11. Let's pray. Father, we pray for our nation. We remember 9-11. We remember how you brought us all together, that you made us one, that you helped us go after you with a new fervency. And Lord, we want to continue to do that. We ask that you draw us together as a nation, that you raise up godly leaders that can call out the best in us, that can call us back to you. Lord, we repent as a nation. Your word promises that if we come back to you, I mean, wow, if my people who are called by my name will humble themselves and pray and seek your face, that you will hear and you will answer our prayers and you'll restore our land. So that's our heartfelt prayer. And we pray all this in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit and all the people said, amen. I'm going to invite you to remain standing if you can as we get ready to worship. If you uh, feel like you're standing too long, feel free to sit back down. But let's, uh, let's worship the Lord.
Uh, we've been uh, looking at a few things out of uh, Psalms, Psalms 150, that blueprint for worship, blueprint for how we're to worship. And let's just read these first three verses uh, again here this morning. Praise the Lord. Praise God in his sanctuary. Praise him in his mighty heavens. Praise him for his acts and his power. Praise him for his surpassing greatness. Praise him with the sound of the trumpet. And praise him with the harp and the lyre. So we've been looking at, at individual verses out of, out of the psalm, and today it's verse 2. And if we remember, each of these verses is part of the blueprint. And we started with where do we praise God? And we praise him where? Everywhere. And not just in every location, but in every circumstance, in every relationship. But now we look at verse 2. And verse 2 brings to us why do we praise God? And we praise God because of who he is. We praise him for his attributes. We praise him because he is worthy. In fact, if we look at some of the attributes of God, he is immutable. He is self-sufficient. He is omnipotent, omniscient, omnipresent, eternal, wise, faithful, just, merciful, gracious, loving, and holy, glorious. This is the God that we worship. And we worship him because of who he is. But as you think about worship, worship has a reflection on you because what you revere, the things that are important to you, well, it's what you begin to resemble. So if you think about what you worship, as you worship, you become what you worship. So if you want those attributes in your life of, what, of who God is, well, let's just worship God. So Psalm 150 is short and it is rich. But with that, we're going to dig into our first song here this morning. And, um, and it's, we're, we're doing a lot of wonderful old hymns here today. And uh, of course, we're doing them in a little more modern fashion. But in this this song, uh, the writer of it, it was back in 1886, and he was an aspiring songwriter. He was a clergyman, and uh, and lived in Scotland, and struggled with creating songs. These songs were, uh, you know, he had it on his heart to be a songwriter. But but he would he would write the words, and he would tweak the words, and he would adjust the words. And I, I had spent some time in the music industry, and we always used to say that great songs are never written, they're rewritten. Well, one day, this song literally just came to him. Word for word, note for note, and it's the song that we're gonna get to sing now. I lay 
next song is called The Love of God, and what an amazing subject, of course, but it was written back in the early 19th century, so around 1917, and there was a guy in California, uh, Matheson was his last name, professional man, uh, but lost his job, needed to make a living, and uh, so living in Southern California, he became a fruit packer, lemons and oranges to be precise, very boring job, and was just struck one day uh, after having an incredibly fitful night of sleep. M the night of misery is what he calls it. Doesn't, we don't know what it was so bad, but he went into work the next day, and to him came the song. And at verse one, the chorus of verse two, but he was, he, was, he was just impacted the fact there needs to be a third verse. He knew there had to be a third verse, but he could not write the third verse. He couldn't figure it out. Weeks went by, and so he remembers uh, in, in a book, somebody had given him a card and he was using it as a bookmark. So he goes to that bookmark and there are the words that became the third verse. And for a long time, nobody really knew where it came from, but they figured it out. You see, that verse the, to the song that was written back in 1917, that third verse, which is the, we're only going to do two of them today, and the second one is that third verse, was written by a rabbi in the year 1000. So in the year 1000, in the Hebrew language, when English didn't even exist yet, he wrote this verse as a prayer to God. And it ended up in a card, ended up in translated into English and fit perfectly with the melody and the rhythm that he had written. So it's amazing how God knew a thousand years before that song was even written what needed to be there. So if you feel like your life is not making an impact in the kingdom, maybe just wait a thousand years and see what happens.
seated. That was that was awesome. Thank you. Uh, we come to uh, testimony time. It's uh, your opportunity to be the church with one another to kind of check in if if God has done something in your life personally and you want to share it. Uh, come on up, Heidi. Um, this is part of what being the church is all about. I was. <laughs> I was the first person yesterday to get marked, my number marked for the Medina mini triathlon. So I ran around screaming, number one, number one. And I was far from that. Everybody joined in to make a great event. Um, Brother Bill was in a kayak ready to rescue people that needed during the swim time. And or baptized, but it them didn't under. happen. Um, so there was so many of you, many of you are wearing our t-shirt from yesterday and many of you are not. Do you want to stand up just for fun? Um, who participated and were there. Michelle was there as well. But thank you guys so much. Yay. Uh, the 12th. The first day of training for next year. Woo! Um, so there was a swim, there was the bike, and there was a run. And we were doing it um, to be endurance people, of course. And I think of that physically and spiritually, especially as we run this race. Sometimes you felt like you feel like you're by yourself. And of course, we are not alone ever. Um, although sometimes you're by yourself. It seems like you're by yourself. Lonely run. Lonely run. <laughs> um, we are gathering proceeds um, for the Vineyard of God, which is a private elementary school in Bandera, Texas. And we have Miss Katie Stegmiller, who is the second grade teacher, first grade teacher, first in kinder, kindergarten and first grade. Um, and she started working there in 2019, is that correct? And this school has started nine years ago um, from Bernice and Rebecca Escobar, who is now named Tristan, because she got married June 10th, praise God. Um, I know I'm going to take too long, but the main thing no. is I, I have extra t-shirts and I want your money. Yesterday we raised $2,300, so I'm going to cut to the chase on that. I'm going to give you one more opportunity, and of course, anytime you come to me in the next year, I'll donate this money to them. But I'm going to stand in the back of the foyer with extra t-shirts, and we have a unanimous donor who would like to match your funds today. So get your pocketbooks out. I'll take cash or check. And um, I'll tell you more about the Vineyard of God, but Katie is a prime example um, of what's going on there and super exciting. Thank you, thank you, thank you. I'd love to talk all day. I think it's great. Come on up, Mark. Yeah, two weekends ago, I had attended a Via de Cristo weekend, which is like Walk to Emmaus in the Methodist Church, and with Percy and Ada, my wife Mary, and I just, uh, you know, praise God for it. It was a, a time of study and worship and music and, most of all, uh, closeness, a renewal and refreshing time of being close with Christ. So I you know, just can't say enough good things about it. So thank you, Lord, and thank you, Percy and Ada. Amen. Thank you. Yes, Terry. I love that people aren't shy about their faith. Uh, I see Lewis coming up. I know he recently had back surgery. Oh. 
I'm going to make him work. This is part of your physical therapy. I'm married to a PT. <laughs> Harder, faster. Where's, where's Anna? <laughs> uh, mini try. I'm glad I can walk. <laughs> Thank you all for your prayers. I appreciate it. I, I'm thankful for God's grace. I'm thankful for his, his hand and his healing and being able to progress as far as I have. I'm very thankful. But I know 90% of his support has been your prayers, and I really appreciate that. Thank you. All right. Chainsaw girl. We had a faith in action. No, come here. We had a faith in action a, a couple of years ago, and man, she is wicked on a chainsaw. So that's that's the story behind that. Thank, thank you. <laughs> um, uh, we are celebrating Weston's third birthday today. Um, so we have some there, very there he is, right there. <laughs> very special grandparents in town to help us with that celebration. Three years old. Okay, I'm going to do this. We're going to sing happy birthday. Can we do that? <laughs> happy birthday, Weston. Are we ready? Uh, let, let's really do this right. Okay, come on up. You already adjusted. New York City? No, the country. Just oh. New York. <laughs> but now I'm going someplace else. I haven't seen my son Michael in 15 years, so I'm going to Florida. There's a family feud there, so I just made my mind up last Christmas to call them up and see if they're going to accept me. So. I praise God that they are, <laughs> and um, so I'm leaving. Um, I'm leaving Tuesday, and I'm flying. That's my big. I'm not driving. I'm flying, <laughs> and that's on an airplane. I don't even know the name of. <laughs> really serious, my daughter. It's cheap, but still, I still don't know the name of it. <laughs> so I'm a little afraid. I'm afraid of flying anyhow, whether it's on a big one or a little one. So pray for me. I just really, really nervous. It's Nancy, right? Nancy is the one that lives here, yeah. Okay. But I'm okay. going to see Micah. Because I have six of them. Okay. okay. All right. Uh, I smile every time I see you, so I can't wait to see you again. So we're Percy, we're gonna pray in a minute. Got that? Percy's gonna lead us in prayer. A anyone else? Uh, David or Lee, why don't you come up and we'll follow it up with David. Oh, Ashley, you come. Well, we're talking about testimonies, and I have two of my grandchildren here today. You guys want to stand up real quick? <laughs> Turn around. Wave to the people. <laughs> That's part of my testimony is... Um, my grandchildren. I have two more, Chuck and I do, but then again, my dad and my niece is here visiting too. Sierra, stand up, Sierra. <laughs> and just an aside, if anyone has any questions about in your, full, in your thingy about the Common Sense Fair that's coming up next month, ask me. Thank okay. You. All right. Thank you for that, Lee. Come on up. I just want to thank this congregation, and a lot of you have seen me grow up. I, yesterday was my 65th birthday, and thanks, everybody. Thank you, Lord. Happy birthday. All right. Come on up, Percy, and I'll let you uh, lead us in prayer. I ask you to bow your hearts. 
not just your heads, but your hearts before our God. We're overwhelmed, Lord. Nothing is in our control. Not the thoughts of others, not the way things are done. Everything seems to fall apart once in a while. Relationships, bodies, the health. And then we see the joy. We see the joy of answered prayers. We see you moving in our lives, in our families, in ways we wouldn't have expected. And we get confused. We get confused by our failures and by your faithfulness. Help us turn to you today. Help us as we're praying now. Make it your hand touching our hearts that we would speak the things you want to speak. I, I, I understand not wanting to fly. <laughs> We don't know whether you get on the plane, whether you stand around for days in the airport wondering when's my next flight. We understand that stuff. We pray for all those who provide that transportation. Those companies would get settled, be able to do what they're supposed to do. We, we pray for everyone who feeds people in transit. We pray for everyone who moves from one place to another, that we'd all get there safely. We ask you to guard our families, the people we love and care for, the ones you've given us that we might be close to them. We ask you to guard and guide those families, wherever they are, whatever their situation. We ask you to help us remember those who have gone before us. Remember them as your children, our brothers and sisters, our children, our parents, grandparents, and whatever. Help us to remember them with love because you love them every bit as much as you love us. We ask you, Lord, to be with those who are struggling, whether it's hospitalized, or thank you for being with Lewis and others who have gone through times of uh, great discomfort. We ask you to bless Anna and all of her ministry with people in recovery. We also ask, Lord, that you would bless everyone who's fallen, Think of everyone that's in prison or in jail or, or wandering around not sure what they're doing. We ask you to bless and watch over them that they would know your love for them is bigger than their struggle. Your love for them is greater than their falling. We ask you, Lord, to be with those who have lost loved ones. Oh, Father. They were precious. And they are still precious to you, but some of us hurt. Lord, touch the hurt. Be with every battle that's being fought now. And this week, as we approach a wedding, a marriage thing, help those who are fighting each other to get healing in that. Be with those who are fighting, whether it's cancer or any other disease, that they might have your hand with them. Let them know that you're with them. Let them not be alone in that battle as the nights are cold and hard and the days show no hope. Be with everyone who's feeling lost. That your light might shine on them through the power and the presence of your Holy Spirit, through the reality of the, of the gift of Jesus Christ, that no one would be afraid to live today and tomorrow. And finally, Lord, remind us again as we pray together. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us and lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Amen. Thank you for that. Just a reminder that in your pews, 
there are these cards and um, encourage you to uh, take one of those. That's a great way to reach out to people and invite them to church. And uh, it has two sides on the back side. It says a special invitation for you from our pastor. If they scan the, the QR code, there's a video message from me, as well as some of the answers to life's most challenging questions. And uh, I've already gotten some feedback from some of you. It's, it's not that hard to do. Um, you can say something if you want. You can just leave it with a tip. Um, pray about who God would have you give this to. Hmm? Oh, there are welcome cards in your pews. You can put those in the, the offering box as well. Yes, Linda, what's up? Oh, the children are dismissed for children's church. So, um, Lee, you can go. I'm kidding you. So uh, feel free to go if you want. If you want to stay here, you can stay here as well. So uh, please take advantage of that. Let's go ahead and pray for this time we have together. Father, we thank you that you're a good God that loves to give good things to his children. And we thank you for your word, and we're excited that we get to open ourselves up to what you want to feed us through your word. We pray that it may nourish us and help us to be more like you. May it help us to see the word made flesh more clearly. But most of all, may it help us know you and love you more deeply, as well as those around us. And we pray all this in Jesus' name and all the people said, amen, amen. If you have your Bibles, and I hope you do, let's go ahead and open them up to Titus. Titus. We started a new study last week. It's going to be a short study. It's only three chapters and like 46 verses or something like that. And uh, last week we covered uh, chapter 1. And we talked about last week that uh, three letters make up what we often call the pastoral epistles. We looked at 1 Timothy and 2 Timothy, and this morning we're looking at Titus. Now the thing is, chronologically, Titus is kind of in between 1 Timothy and 2 Timothy. Paul wrote it to another spiritual son in the faith, Titus. Uh, You get the sense when you read Timothy uh, that there is a difference between Timothy and Titus. Uh, Paul has to encourage Timothy a lot more. Maybe he was uh, more timid, but he has to over and over again say things like, uh, take courage, be bold. He doesn't have to do that with Titus, and uh, which makes me think that Titus was kind of... uh, take no prisoner kind of guy. Uh, we talked about how he was very active in helping Paul with the church in Corinth, which, which was a really messed up church. And um, he sends Titus to an island in the Mediterranean called Crete. It was a very densely populated island, uh, had a lot of different churches. We looked at last week how Paul told Titus to appoint elders, plural, in every city of that uh, island. And we ended last week looking at, uh, if, if you want to go ahead and look at it, Titus chapter 1, where is it? He talks about in verse 10, the circumcision. And we spent a lot of time talking about the Judaizers, which was a group of Jews who believed Jesus was a Messiah. And that's a, that's a great thing, Right. But they couldn't let go of the law or their legalism. And it would be one thing if they kind of kept that to themselves. But they tried to put that on the Gentiles that were coming to the Lord as well. They would say such things like, hey, it's great that you recognize our Jewish Messiah. But for you to really receive Jesus, you have to first become a Jew, which meant embracing the law and the feast and the ceremony and the dietary laws and something called circumcision. And this was so serious in the church that the church convened its first church council. You can read about it in Acts chapter 15. And the result of that council was to not lay on the Gentiles a burden that Jews have trouble carrying. That a person really is saved by grace. And that's kind of where we ended last week. And if you look at chapter 2, beginning with verse 1, you immediately see contrast in this letter. Uh, Paul says, but as for you, so there's contrast, 
Speak the things which are proper for sound doctrine. Speak the things that are necessary for sound doctrine. The word sound can mean healthy. And there's something about good, healthy, sound doctrine. It'll affect the way you live. Uh, sound doctrine doesn't just have to do with understanding intellectual, theological concepts, though that's part of it. Sometimes I think we complicate Christianity a lot more than what's needed. I remember that great theologian that was once asked, hey, tell us the most theological statement you know, and his answer was, Jesus loves me, this I know, for the Bible tells me so. You know, that's really what's necessary. But here's the thing. What you believe really impacts the way you live. The Bible says, as a man thinks, so he becomes. And here's the beautiful thing. When you give your life to Christ, there's an instant transformation. 2 Corinthians 5.17 says, anyone in Christ is a new creation. The old things passed away, new things have come. And Romans 12.2 talks about how we need to be very intentional about not being conformed to the world's way of thinking, but instead be transformed by the renewing of our mind. And remember the context, Crete, and, and I failed to mention this, in chapter 1, they had a reputation of being, I think the King James says, evil beast or something like that. They, they were lazy, they were cheaters. Um, if anyone needed sound doctrine, it was the people in Crete. So it's no wonder Paul says, speak the things which are proper for sound doctrine. Now, in verses 2 through 10, and I'm so excited to talk about this, Paul begins to talk about how the church is supposed to function with one another. Interpersonal relationships, but more accurately, intergenerational relationships. And that is so important, because back in the 60s, something happened. You know, there was a radical shift in culture, and psychologists noticed that there was a, a radical disconnect between the younger generation and the older generation, and that's where the term generation gap was coined. And somehow we think that there is always a generation gap between different types of ages. And I do understand the, the need in some cases to divide age groups, right? There, there is a certain degree of wisdom, you know, nursery with nursery, children with children, youth with the youth, adults with adults. However, if we really want to be a biblical fellowship, we need to not just allow intergenerational relationships, we need to encourage them. And that's what Paul is talking about in these verses. He talks about how old men need to operate. Then he talks about old women. And I'm not going to step into that. I'm not going to tell you what constitutes old, except to say that you know when you're there, right? But in many ways, age is just a number. It's an attitude. I know people in their 20s who act very old in a bad way, and I know people in their 90s. Where's Billy? <laughs> right there. Who acts extremely young in a good way, right? And, and I will tell you something. I, I've noticed, it, and it tends to happen with older people, but it can happen to anyone, that after a while of life and living, what tends to happen if you're not careful is you get bumped and bruised, you get hurt and wounded, and the tendency if the wound goes really deep is to begin to build those walls, you know what I'm talking about? To, to not let anyone hurt you in that same kind of way again. And the tragedy is, and maybe you've run across someone, or maybe you are struggling with that this morning, you tend to become old and bitter and angry. And if that's you this morning, I got some good news. I have seen firsthand God heal a heart like that. But it takes some courage. It takes letting down those walls and allowing God into those deepest places of hurt. 
but he can create a new heart instantly. And maybe that's what God wants you to do. Maybe if you don't hear anything else this morning, that's what you need to hear. But he talks about older men. He talks about older women. Then he talks about younger men, younger women. So let's look at this together. He says in verse 2, that the older men be sober, and, and that word sober appears over and over again in this chapter. It means to think clear, sober, reverent. Some of your Bibles might say dignified, same thing. Temperate, that means to be sensible and reasonable. Sound in faith, in love, in patience. The King James says what? Long-suffering. And then it says in verse 3, the older women likewise, that they be reverent in behavior, not slanderers. The New American Standard says not malicious gossips, not given to much wine. How about this? Teachers of good things. And I think of Philippians 4, 9, where Paul says, whatever is true, whatever is noble, whatever is just, whatever is lovely, whatever is of good report. If there is anything praiseworthy, he says, dwell on those things. Teach on those things as well. Verse 4, that they may admonish the young women, notice this, Travis, to love their husbands. I say that because Ephesians chapter 5, Travis is so quick to point out that when it talks about different ways to submit, wives need to submit to their husbands, husbands need to love their wives, you're always quick to point out, hey, it doesn't say that wives need to love their husbands, but it does here. It does here. Uh, that older women are to admonish the younger women to love their husbands, to love their children, verse 5, to be discreet, chaste, homemakers, good, obedient to their husbands. We'll come back to that, I promise. That the word of God may not be blasphemed. Okay, let's tackle that. Verse 5, obedient to, to their own husbands. That's actually a bad translation. The word obedient is hupotasso in the Greek. It means submit. And, and it's actually an awesome word. In fact, this might surprise you. We're all called to submit. Every single one of us. Ephesians 5.21 says, submit to one another out of reverence to Christ. And then it breaks down to how that's supposed to look in the family. Wives, submit to your husbands. Husbands, love your wives as Christ loved the church and gave himself up for her. I mean, that's really a higher standard of submission. How children need to submit by obeying their parents. And how parents, more specifically fathers, need to submit by not exasperating their children to anger. Now, the word submission is actually two Greek words put together, hupotasso, hupo meaning under, tasso meaning to support. It's actually a military word. It implies rank and order. The idea is that if you have an army and everyone is calling their own shots, it's chaotic. And, uh, you know, I, I don't know. We're about to head into this marriage retreat. I know we're probably going to be talking about this. But um, in terms of submission, ladies, it doesn't mean that you are in any way inferior to your husbands. It doesn't mean that at all. Just think of Jesus. Jesus was God in the flesh, right? Absolutely, totally, 100% God. Yet Jesus consistently in Scripture submitted to the will of the Father, right? Remember the prayer in the Garden of Gethsemane? He said, Father, if there's any way for this cup of suffering to pass from me, in other words, if we can bypass the suffering and death on the cross to save humanity, let's do that. Yet what did he pray? Not my will, but yours be done. And since he ended up going to the cross, I says, there is no other name under heaven by which men can be saved. I also think of Philippians chapter 2, where it talks about how even though Jesus existed in the form of God, he did not regard equality with God a thing to be grasped. The idea is taken advantage of. But instead, what did he do? He emptied himself and took the form of a slave and became obedient to the point of death. And as a result of that, what happened? God exalted him. You see, that's a biblical principle. When we humble ourselves, God is always faithful to exalt us. 
and gave him a name that is above every name, that at the name of Jesus every knee shall bow and every tongue confess that Jesus Christ is Lord. Now, here's the thing, and I learned this from this couples class that, that, that we did. Women can process, some of you know where I'm going with this. Help me with this because I already forgot it. W women can process, like, relational stuff seven times faster than men. That's true. That is true. I don't know if you heard that, Sherry said, and multitask. Now, why God ordained men to be head of the family? I'm still trying to figure that out. Except to say that there is order to that. And, and I, I'm sure I might be speaking for a lot of men here. My experience is most men, most men feel totally ill-equipped to lead the family. And, and most men, hey, if, if I'm ill-equipped, I'm not even going to try. I'm not even going to try. And that's where you ladies come in. The best thing you can do is hupotasso, get up under and support him, to pray, to, to be there, to be his backup, to believe in him. Because behind every great man of God is a great woman of God. And really, sometimes we forget the goal of marriage. The goal of marriage is to become one flesh, right? And, and that's why the enemy will do everything possible to try to bypass that, to try to break up marriages. Because if he can break up a marriage, if he can break up two people from truly being one flesh, there is spiritual breakthrough when a couple prays together as one flesh. I've seen it. I've experienced it. That's the goal. I think of ballroom dancing. I love this analogy. I love watching people that really know how to dance, ballroom dancing, because when you see people who are really good at it, it's nearly impossible to tell who's leading. But someone is leading, and that's the goal of marriage, right, to be totally one flesh so that to the rest of the world, hey, you know, they are one. They're not two living under the roof. So this is something that we ought to be excited about. That's our goal, to be one flesh. Okay. Where did I leave off? Okay, I'm on verse 6 now. Likewise, likewise, exhort the young men to be sober-minded. There's that word again. In all things, showing yourself to be a pattern of good works in doctrine, showing integrity, reverence, incorruptibility, sound speech that cannot be condemned, that one who is an opponent may be ashamed, having nothing evil to say to you. And then he goes on in verse 9 to talk about slaves, and we don't have slaves, at least in this country, but we do have employees, so you could probably apply this in that area. He says, exhort bond servants to be obedient to their own masters, to be well-pleasing in all things, not answering back, Verse 10, not pilfering, that's stealing, but showing all good fidelity that they may adorn the doctrine of God our Savior in all things. And I kind of want to spend some time on that last part in verse 10, that they may adorn the doctrine of God our Savior in all things. Adorn. What do you think of when you think of adorn? It comes from a Greek word from which we get the word cosmetic. In other words, you and I need to wear the doctrine of God and His grace in such a way that we make God look good. And by the way, that's what it means to glorify God, to make Him look good. Not that He needs our help. He's already good, but some of us do the opposite, don't we? We need to adorn the doctrine of God, our Savior, in all things. And then I want you to notice verse 11. And I want to kind of put this on the screen for a, a moment. It says, For the grace of God that brings salvation has appeared to all men. I'm going to let you just kind of look at that, read that, and ask yourself, what do you think that means? 
That's something worth underlining because there's some incredible theology in that one verse alone. Let me read it again. For the grace of God that brings salvation, notice the last part, has appeared to all men. You know, there are some people, some extreme Christians, who believe that God's grace, the grace that brings salvation, only appears to some people. You know, that verse, John three sixteen, for God so loved the world. Well, God didn't really, really mean the world. God so loved the elect that he gave his only begotten son, that whosoever, oh, it's not really talking about whosoever, it's talking about the elect. Whosoever believes shall not perish but have everlasting life. You know, 2 Peter chapter 3 says it's God's wish for all to come to salvation. And, and I hate to be too theological, and we've talked about this in months past, but there are two extremes when it comes to theology. One extreme, and I'm talking extreme, not all Calvinists are like this, but extreme Calvinists really push the sovereignty of God to the exclusion of free will. And then there are the Arminians, and I'm talking extremes here, that push free will to the point that they completely exclude God's sovereignty. And if you ask me, and I'm just a simple theologian, I think we spend too much time thinking about all this. I think the answer is somewhere in the middle because I can give you tons of verses that support either extreme. And here's the dangerous thing that I've seen happen over and over and over again. When you fall in one or the other extreme, you always distort who God is. The answer is somewhere in the middle. Because the Bible does teach that God is sovereign. Nothing happens without his permission. And yet at the same time, you have the whosoever verses. You have verses in the Old Testament, choose this day. You have this principle that God will hold us responsible for the choices we make. Well, if we can't help it, how can he... You get that, don't you? The answer is really somewhere in the middle. And I love this verse because this says, The grace of God that brings salvation has appeared not just to some people, but to all people. That is so important that we understand that. And I frustrate people because I, I, I often, sometimes when I'm around theological people, they ask me, well, you know, which camp do I fall in? And I say, I'm a Calvinian. No, somewhere kind of in the middle. So I refuse to be labeled in either, either camp. Okay, it goes on to say, verse 12, teaching us that denying ungodliness and worldly lusts, we shall live soberly, righteously, and godly in the present age. Looking for the blessed hope, verse 13, and glorious appearing of our great God and Savior, Jesus Christ. I'm going to hang on verse 13 here for a moment, the, the second part of this passage. Because I think that's worth reflecting on as well. Because there are some people that say, nowhere in Scripture in black and white does it teach that Jesus Christ is God. Look at the last part. Looking for the blessed hope and glorious appearing, here it is, of our great God and Savior, Jesus Christ. Wow. And then finally it says, verse 14, who gave himself for us that he might redeem us from every lawless deed and purify for himself his own special people, zealous for good works. I want you to notice his own special people. And I, I want to point this out because sometimes, especially in America, we think of Christianity as, as an individual exercise. And here's the thing. The Bible does teach that it is an individual decision. I can't believe for you. You can't believe for me. We just talked about that verse in 2 Corinthians 5.17. Anyone, anyone in Christ is a new creation. Praise God for that. But also, we need to understand that our belief in Christ is a corporate thing as well. We're the body of Christ, and when you believe individually, you're born into a family of God. I mean, we talked about that verse in Ephesians 5.22 about husbands ought to love their wives as Christ loved the church and gave himself up for her. So I need you. 
you need me, and together we need Christ, right? And so it's no wonder that Paul finally says, speak these things, exhort and rebuke with all authority. Let no one despise you. Now, what do we want to do with this? You know, the challenge when we look at a passage like this, especially verses 2 through 10, when we talked about intergenerational relationships, where do you fit in? Where do you fit into the story? I really think the church is in a unique position to be multi-generational like few other institutions. Let me give you an example, and I got permission for this, okay? Caitlin, come up here for a second. Sherry, come up here for a second. I, I, I just think it's important that you guys kind of see what this is all about. Uh, this is my daughter. How many of you have tried to adopt her? A few of you have. I mean, you've got many surrogate moms and dads out there, and I feel sorry for any guy that gets serious about you because they're going to have to go through a lot of roadblocks um, before they even get to me. Uh, but here's the thing. Um, these two started getting together every Friday. Initially, initially, it was only for voice lessons. And it turned out into something else, didn't it? Do either of you, I know I'm putting you on the spot, do any of you want to say anything about that? Go ahead. So, yes, it started out as vocal lessons, but Sherry and I have a lot of things in common, and there's some things on her heart she wants to share to me, and vice versa, so it's become more of a moment where our spirits can be filled. Yeah. And it, 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 it began, I mean, you have some years on her, right? <laughs> Talking and, and, and growing in worship and the most beautiful thing, and I smile because I see your vehicles out here on Friday, and there's part of me that just wants to bust in, but I'm like, God's like, don't you dare. <laughs> because I know what they're doing in here. They're, they're not just doing voice or, or talking about worship. What's happening here is mentoring and discipleship, exactly what we talked about. And I could give you other examples as well, how older men have done that with younger men right here. Are you, are you starting to catch a vision of what we can be about as a church? Um, you older folks, you have a ton of experience. You made a ton of mistakes. You got younger folks here who are hungry for what you have. And you younger folks. Yeah, y'all can sit down. You can preach your own sermon at this point, right? But let's, let's take advantage of that. Let's be intentional. Let's look. You know, we did this couples class, and there were, there were people that have been married 50-plus years, and there have been people who have been less married less than five years, and it was a beautiful thing to watch the mentoring and discipleship take place. If we want to be a biblical fellowship, we need to, like I said, not just allow those relationships, we need to encourage them. Amen? I'm going to invite us all to stand at this time, and we'll have a word of prayer. Father, we're so thankful for your word and the challenge is to kind of figure out where we fit into this text. We have people of all ages, old, young, somewhere down in the middle. Man, I think of um, Abraham who was 120 years old, and the Bible says he was full of vigor. Man, I want that. Caleb, 85 years old when he went into the promised land. I want that mountain. I'm just as strong now as I was 40 years ago. There might be some older people here who think that they're done, that there's nothing more that God can do through them. That's a lie. 
There might be some younger people here who think that their age somehow disqualifies them from really being used. Jeremiah was just a youth when you began to speak through him. Lord, we just want to give you free reign in our lives and in the life of this church. We thank you that you are God. There's no one like you. We thank you that no one is beyond your reach for salvation. And Lord, if there's someone here who who either doesn't know you and wants to know you, would you just take all the initiative? Would you move into their heart? Would you show yourself how good you really are and help people just really surrender to you? There might be others who feel like they've gotten away and distracted and maybe feel like they're a hundred steps away from you. Would you show them it's only one step back? Lord, we want to be a church that makes you smile, that glorifies you, We want to adorn ourselves with your goodness so that others are hungry and thirsty for what we have in you. So, Lord, have your way. And we pray all this in Jesus' name. Amen. Before we start worship, let me just give this invitation. The altar is always open. After the service, we will have a prayer team off to my right who would love to pray and love on you. Please take advantage of them. And let's just worship this time.
Life is worth the living just because he lives. Uh, may you adorn the grace of God in such a way that people want what you have. May God give you opportunities to show him off for who he is, and may you give him all the glory and all the praise. Go in peace and serve the Lord in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. All the people said, amen. amen. Prayer off in this corner. Deal here. 